Jay, Jay Bala, that uh, the nifty uh, high that we saw in 2022 is unsustainable. Till year end, it's possible that the nifty can hold on or go up to levels of 18,738. But on the way down, he's going to be watching out for whether 18,130 as a support holds. But let's talk about the big newsmaker of the day, and that is the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan shocked global financial markets by increasing the cap on the 10-year yield from 0.25% to 0.5%. Asian equities fell, the yen strengthened after the announcement. Lata joins us for more on the sudden announcement from Bank of Japan. Lata? Well, basically, the Bank of Japan is going to allow the yield on the 10-year to rise from 0.25, where it was capping it, to 0.5%. Uh, just for those who are not following Japan very closely, the Japanese central bank has had a policy of yield curve control, YCC, as they called it. It was a way to keep yields low so that they could kickstart the economy. Now that is coming under a bit of a question because globally yields have gone up so much that, as the BOJ says, is creating uh, financial uh, uh, issues. And you, Japanese inflation has gone up to almost 2%, 1.99. Uh, previously, it was in 2014 that it had seen such levels. After that, it has been, you know, even negative numbers uh, in terms of uh, Japanese inflation. So there was a need. But it was a totally unexpected move. The uh, current uh, BOJ uh, governor was to, uh, is going to retire uh, or end his term uh, in April, and any change was expected only then. So the market is totally not positioned for this change by the third largest economy. Now, why is it important? It's a sign that the last major central bank has also pivoted and become hawkish. It is believed, I mean, the market's perception is now this means that uh, uh, Japan will exit its loose policy. It was the only, it, you know, it, the cross-asset funding by using yen was a very large trade because it was the only cheap currency. You could take cheap uh, yen loans and then cross-fund other assets. That source now is kind of drying up. Japanese investors, I mean, a lot of Japanese money has been invested in U.S. treasuries. As it is, the, the, the Fed is going to buy less and less. There's already a tightening there. One more set of people may stop buying. You know, when Japanese investors who are among the biggest globally find that there is a little more money to be made in their own assets, they may flee or at least move a little bit out of other assets as well around the world. That explains why you saw risk assets everywhere falling. And then the last and the most important impact, Japan is the third largest economy. A rise in rates over there can reduce Japanese pace of growth as well, such as it is, however, uh, my, uh, you know, uh, slow that pace has been. So this is definitely uh, only slightly less important than, you remember Powell's pivot in uh, end November 2021? It's almost as important uh, uh, an event as that, according to market participants. Right, uh, Lata, thank you very much. Uh, very exhaustive. Uh, let's welcome in uh, Paul Schul, uh, who is joining us, founder and editor at Schul Research. Paul, great to have you with us here on CNBC TV 18. Thank you very much. Is this, should we yeah, read what you. has happened from, the, uh, from Japan today as a pivot? Or, uh, you know, is this more technical in nature? They've done something now, but eventually they're going to persist with, uh, you know, the easy policy they've been following for years now. What is your sense? Uh, yeah, your, 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 your commentator did a good job on that. <clears throat> what I would add is that there has been, and I'm telling you, immense, immense um, uh, profound pressure inside the Bank of Japan to get the uh, Monetary Policy Committee of the BOJ to, you know, get its uh, act in order and start to raise interest rates. Um, so I think this was something that that, that could not be um, fended off anymore, especially after the rate rise in the U.S. Uh, last week. That's the first thing. The second thing is <clears throat> uh, the Japan is still miles behind everybody else. I mean, J Japan is 300 basis points behind the U.S. And so this is, at this point, this is barely nothing uh, relative to other central banks, even in Europe. You know, uh, Europe's way, way ahead. And, and so, so that's the second point. The third point is if these rates go any higher, the budget blows out. Um, the Bank of Japan ends up having huge uh, uh, losses um, from bond losses as rates go up, and, and so you're 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 in danger of bankrupting the Bank of Japan's balance sheet and um, wrecking the uh, federal budget of Japan, and and they're aware of that. So they're going to have to stay way way behind everybody else just because of the of the factors. 
uh, that I just mentioned. <clears throat> and so I, I think this is not a pivot. I think this is a technical surrender to the hawks inside the BOJ who were furious with the top leadership of the BOJ for being so asleep. Uh, and so I think this is a little bit of a capitulation, not a pivot. Uh, Paul, but are we going to see a capitulation in terms of Japanese equities and the strengthening of the yen? Will the ripple effects of this pivot uh, continue to be felt across? Because as you pointed out, they're still miles behind, 300 basis points lower than where the Fed is right now. So if they've just gotten started, how bad do things get? I, yeah, I, I don't think it's a pivot. I don't think this is a like a, a taste of things to come. I think they have to keep that because you know uh, you know fifty percent of GDP uh, you know is 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 in the Bank of Japan's balance sheet of these JGBs, right? And 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 if if rates go up to anywhere near the U.S., you know we're, we're talking about a, a central government budget where you know interest payments are going to be you know half of the <laughs> Half of the government revenue, right, is going to have to be used to to make interest payments, and that's not that's not acceptable, right? And so I don't think it's a pivot. I think the I agree with your commentator that the the yen goes back to you know more on the weak side than than the strong side. I think this is not a taste of things to come. I think it's a capitulation to, and I'm telling you, there are extreme hawks inside the BOJ who wanted heads uh, because of their sense of recklessness um, uh, by the current BOJ leadership. Uh, although, Paul, uh, you know, <clears throat> in, uh, inflation has found its way into Japan as well, right? I mean, I think core inflation is uh, now at uh, 2%. After what, uh, 20, 25 years, uh, there is... Yeah, there... hallelujah. I mean, uh, Japan's been trying to get inflation for 20, <laughs> for 20 years. They finally got it. I think that that you know, um, if the yen was going to get too too weak, I think you were going to be asking to import even more inflation. So this appreciation of the yen relative to the dollar is sort of welcome news. Uh, at 130, I mean 150, you were asking for a lot of inflationary impulses to come into Japan. But but um, I think the BOJ is aiming for two uh, percent or three percent. I, I think. Uh, the BOJ understands that monetary policy ha has a has a, a lag effect. Um, I, they're they're a lot more relaxed than any other central bank on inflation. Uh, they think they're right. Uh, I think they're right. I think there's going to be a really big drop in inflation next year. Uh, I think the Fed is behind the curve. I think the Fed uh, doesn't uh, is not understanding the lag effect going on right now. Uh, and so, you know, we have to see where these inflation targets end up uh, being. But I think in the case of India, I think that, that this is a, a little bit of noise. I think in India's case, there is now um, a, a flood of money going back into China for the first time in like three years. And so I think that, that the pressure that the Indian equity market feels right now is money that's moving back into China for the first time in like 36 months. And so I think that's the big story is how well China is going to re respond and 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 recover from uh, completely doing a, a 180. I mean, talk about a pivot. The greatest pivot in the world is Japan, uh, China's pivot on COVID in the last 10 days. Okay. You know, there's major sickness right now, but I think as that peters out, I think you're going to find a massive bounce in China. And 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 that's the question is whether people are going to emerging market. Right, portfolios are going to, to move back into China uh, away from India because India has been a huge beneficiary of China's um, policies toward COVID. Well, That's the pivot to pay attention to. Yeah, I, I think the legacy of 2022 uh, to the world literature will be the world word pivot, isn't it? Oh, well. <laughs> okay, now just to come back to the Japanese action, uh, do you see this going up further? Will there be one more hawkish action or, or a few more hawkish actions by the BOJ? And notwithstanding that, right now, this step itself, will it have more ramifications around the world? Um, I think a little more, uh, a little bit more um, ripples around the world. I, I like, I, I loved your commentary before. I think it's right on the mark. I think maybe a little bit more, but I don't, I don't see anything much more b before he leaves uh, in the spring. I, I think this is a capitulation event. 
I think everyone knows that if you keep on raising, you know, rates above one, one and a half, you're going to get into a really big problem of bond losses on the Bank of Japan's balance sheet, uh, which other central banks are, are experiencing, plus the, the revenue problems uh, in the, uh, the 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 uh, funding problem in the budget. Uh, for, uh, at the federal level is very problematic if rates go up too much. Uh, and then by the spring, I think we're going to see lower inflation all over the world. So maybe they'll get off the hook a little bit. Okay, so this is one and done, you think, uh, from uh, Japan? Probably another another 25 or something like that. But I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think that's it. Okay. Uh, can you just round up everything you said from an Indian point of view? Uh, there is a global tightening of financial conditions and there is this specific point you mentioned about uh, funds uh, probably preferring China over India for the moment. If you put all that together, do you think we have seen recent highs or do you think 2023 may still bring more equity gains? I think 2023 is going to be a problem because the, the, the basic problem here is um, we have a problem with funding, very high interest rates now, mm -hmm. funding. Um, these um, structures all over the world, uh, especially in the U.S. market. There's a really big funding problem that's going to put pressure on interest rates in 2023. I think the uh, house, U.S. households are supremely underweight bonds. They're supremely overweight equities. I think there's going to be a, 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 a mean reversion there. What India needs to pay attention to is uh, the sustainability of the China recovery uh, post-COVID, post this massive... Um, Wow, this uh, astonishing, um, you know, people are encouraged to go outside with COVID now in China. It, it's, a, it's a complete, uh, you know, um, wild west now in terms of China's approach. And so we're going to get a very big boost of growth now in China. Wild, more like wild east, <laughs> Paul. Wild, wild east, exactly. Yeah. Although, uh, east. yeah, hey, hey man, man, oh, man, China's really done a uh, 180. Uh, my God. Yeah, no, and of course, everyone's sick in China. When everybody's sick, yeah, yeah right now, everybody yeah. has COVID, and so yeah. this this is what happens. You get 14 days of, of of everybody getting sick, and then you know it goes away. Yeah. You know, this is what yeah. tends to happen. Yeah, let's just yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, just to wrap things up, we didn't, I mean, you know, I think uh, last few occasions we spoke, you were saying end of the year, you tend to get some, uh, you know, financial market accidents. We've not got any, right? I mean, I think we've we've escaped that or, or you think there's still time? Well, yeah, last time I was with you, I, I, I've been, uh, you know, I was cautious and I, I thought we were going to have an end of the year. End of the year tends to be a little yeah. bit of a rally going into, the, into December, January. I think we've, we, we, it's one of those terrible to bad. Uh, right. Things have gone from terrible to bad. And that's when you get equity rallies. I am not that confident this is sustainable. I'm just right. not that confident. All right. We uh, have funding problems ahead. Yeah. Funding is funding is everything for 2023. All right, Paul. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been wishing your family, your team, <laughs> a very Merry Christmas. Uh, you know, all the best for the festivities and a Happy New Year in case we don't touch base. I believe you're on a holiday. And we pulled you. Uh, I'm pulled in you Barcelona. In. Yes, beautiful <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> All right, enjoy yourself, Paul. And thank you very much yep. for taking out the time and being with us here thank on so CNBC TV. Thank you. All right, forty points. But look at that. I mean, the market has come. Back.